Did you know the Hylian language was created because of time constraints? Hylian made its first appearance in Ocarina of Time, which was delayed over a year till it finally released near simultaneously in Japan and North America in November 98, then Australia and all over Europe a few weeks later. Usually, games came out in Japan months before, but Nintendo was in such a hurry to release Zelda worldwide before Christmas, they fast-tracked the localization process, with virtually zero regional differences. According to Nintendo's Yoshio Hongo, who you'll hear more about in a minute, Hylian was created for the signs around Hyrule, because it wasn't a real language, and thus could be used worldwide without localizing. Hylian's based on Japanese, but if they'd used actual Japanese, they would have had to redo a bunch of textures in multiple languages, so they cut a corner to save time. The language then became canon. Hongo also notes that unlike past Zelda games, almost all the character names went unchanged as well, and says as a result, foreigners won't get some of the references, like the witch sisters Koume and Kotake, who were named after elderly villainous twin sisters in the 1951 novel Village of Eight Graves. Hongo says Ocarina's final delay happened because of cartridge shortages, pushing back launch exactly one week, which by pure coincidence meant it ended up releasing on the seventh anniversary of the previous console Zelda, A Link to the Past. The Japanese logo was changed pretty late as well, from this to this. The change was made to unify the logos worldwide, but more importantly because the original was too clever for its own good. A lot of Japanese fans saw this as just a decorative hourglass, instead of part of the writing as it was intended, which made them misread the title as The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of the Temple. When Ocarina finally hit store shelves, Hongo revealed it was the most expensive game Nintendo had ever made. Their hope was to sell 5 million copies worldwide, but blew that goal out of the water when they ended up selling over 7.5 million. The game was so big with its then-revolutionary 3D puzzles that Nintendo worried customers wouldn't be able to wrap their minds around it, so the first half million Japanese customers got free Ocarina Hint books bundled in. Also, Nintendo long had a ban on strategy guides releasing on launch day, to avoid spoilers, but they lifted the ban specifically for Ocarina of Time. The final measure they took to help gamers acclimate to 3D was hiring more people for their phone service, the Zelda Dial, where gamers could call if they got stuck in Zelda games, and included the phone number in Ocarina's packaging. These stories and lots more were discussed in 1990s issues of a Japanese magazine called 64 Dream. Every month, readers sent in questions to Nintendo's Yoshio Hongo, who after two decades working in various departments, was intimately involved with Nintendo's core dealings, and got promoted all the way up to head of PR and marketing. He'd answer fan letters across eight pages each issue, in a section called Teach Me Hongo-san N64 Question Box. It's hard to describe Hongo's importance, since he served in so many roles over his tenure, but his public persona is probably most comparable to America's Reggie fils who's important to the business, but also served as the company's public face, appearing in magazines, TV interviews, and commercials. In five years, Hongo answered over a thousand questions, so we went through and picked out the highlights, which is what you're going to see in today's video. We got development info you've probably never heard before, behind the scenes, and Japan-specific trivia for big series like Zelda, F-Zero, and Pokemon, as well as the console itself. And since Hongo was in charge of advertising at the time, we're also going to check out some old Japanese commercials. In fact, let's go ahead and kick off with probably the two weirdest ads during Hongo's tenure, which broadcast in Japan to promote Majora's Mask. Hongo says they were made to emphasize fear, which resulted in calls to get them pulled off the air for scaring children. But Nintendo pressed on anyway. One ad was called The Masks. <laughs> The other was called The Fall of the Moon. Pretty 
pretty different from Nintendo's usual family-friendly image. Majora commercials overseas were kinda weird too, though not on the same level of creepiness. But this American magazine ad of the Twin Towers impending doom does stand out as ominously prophetic, considering it went to print the year before 9-11. The first Pokémon Stadium was originally supposed to be a 64DD launch title, but after getting switched over to Cartridge, only had 40 Pokémon and never released outside Japan. Some fans wondered how Nintendo decided which 40 to include, while the other 111 were left out. We found out. But before we reveal all, a word from this video's sponsor, War Thunder. War Thunder is the ultimate vehicle combat game, available for free on PC and consoles. Take command of over 2,500 meticulously detailed tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from 10 major nations, spanning nearly a century of warfare. From 1920s biplanes and armored cars to modern jets and battle tanks, immerse yourself in epic PvP combat with stunning visuals, realistic graphics, and authentic sound effects, thanks to War Thunder's highly optimized dagger engine, which delivers smooth performance even on on lower-end machines. With its sophisticated damage model, War Thunder ensures every vehicle component, engines, fuel tanks, weapons, and more is vulnerable to destruction, with armor and shells behaving just like their real-world counterparts. The impressive X-ray view feature lets you see exactly how your vehicle was destroyed, pinpointing the hit that led to its downfall. War Thunder offers three gameplay modes, fast-paced arcade, ultra-realistic simulator, and the balanced realistic mode, so there's something for everyone. Customize your vehicles with countless camouflages, historical markings, and decorations, including community-created designs. Join a global community of over 70 million players and experience the most comprehensive military combat game ever made. New players and those who haven't played in the last six months can claim a massive bonus pack across all platforms, featuring premium vehicles, the exclusive Eagle of Valor decoration, 100,000 silver lions, and seven days of premium account. This is available for a limited time only, so act fast and claim your rewards now. And now back to Pokémon Stadium. With only 40 Pokémon, Popular monsters like Pikachu, Venusaur, Charizard, and Blastoise had to make the cut. But according to Hongo, since Stadium was all battling and no role-playing, the devs actually picked the lineup based on what was competitive at the Nintendo Cup. As part of Space World 97's festivities, the Nintendo Cup was Japan's very first national Pokémon tournament. <laughs> A kid named Toru was the champion, and as a result, his entire team was included in Pokémon Stadium. Electrode, Kangaskhan, Starmie, Jinx, Taurus, and Articuno. That's almost a sixth of the entire Stadium decks. Pokémon most used by other competitors were included in the game as well. Mew and Mewtwo were both banned from the tournament, and thus excluded from Stadium, except for the post-credits cliffhanger. All the Nintendo Cup players actually made it into the next game, Pokémon Stadium 2. Battle all the way to the last round, for example, and you'll see the final challenger is Toru himself, with his exact same team. Beat him and you'll earn yourself the final badge. Toru was the first national champ in Pokémon history, so it's fitting he'd get immortalized in an official game. A case could be made that he had a greater impact on the Pokémon franchise than any other fan in history, or at the very least, the Stadium subseries. The Japanese version of Stadium 2 had Nintendo Cups 97, 98, and 99, all paying homage to real-life players and their teams. But in overseas versions of the game, which is probably what you played as a kid, they replaced all three with a single Poké Cup, and removed all the Japanese players and their teams. So instead of Toru, the final battle's just against some random old man. Probably the most famous N64 accessory was the Rumble Pack, which originally came out as a bundle with Star Fox 64. When you hit a meteor or got shot, the controller would vibrate. Truly, it was mind-blowing stuff at the time. Nintendo didn't even let stores demo Rumble Packs, because they were worried people'd steal them. At launch, someone asked how long the battery was supposed to last. Hongo said if you play an hour a day, you could get about two months out of it. But if you're an ace pilot and never get hit, it could last upwards of an entire year. Someone else asked if there'd be a Star Fox 64 too, 
But according to Hongo, Miyamoto thought he'd already done everything that could be done with the format, therefore no sequel needed to get made. It was sort of a meme back in the day that every Nintendo game had 64 in the title. When a reader complained that it was getting played out, Hongo gave a multi-layered explanation that makes sense, but maybe never crossed your mind before. He says Nintendo put 64 in the titles to differentiate games from their Super Famicom equivalents to avoid confusing customers, like Star Fox and Pilot Wings. He said that also explains why new franchises usually didn't have the number, like Super Smash Bros. and Mario Party. He goes on to say using the number will become less necessary further into the generation, as last-gen games fade from memory. We ran the numbers to see if that wound up being true, and for the most part, it was. Later-gen titles were indeed less likely to have 64 in them than earlier-gen titles. By then, previous-gen games weren't really on store shelves anymore, so Nintendo felt even some games in pre-existing series didn't need 64 anymore, like Zelda Ocarina of Time and F-Zero X. By the end of the console's life, a total of 86 games had the number in the name, which is a little over a fifth of the entire library. Speaking of F-Zero X's title, in one issue, a reader asks what X means. Hongo says the game was originally supposed to be F-Zero Max, but they had to change the name due to copyright problems. Some of y'all are probably thinking, hey, maybe that's why they called the next one F-Zero Maximum Velocity. But in Japan, where they had the copyright troubles, they literally just called it F-Zero for Game Boy Advance. But anyway, as far as the meaning of the X, Hongo looks through some documents, then says because X represents an unknown number. He doesn't elaborate, but possibly he meant because the series' numbering had gotten confusing. Thanks to the Satellaview games right before, BSF Zero Grand Prix and BSF Zero Grand Prix 2, not to mention Zero Racers, a Virtual Boy spin-off cancelled around the same time. Hongo says the title's probably also a reference to the game having a track shaped like an X, even though that track wound up in the 64DD expansion rather than the main game, which means only Japanese fans got to play it. Another reader asks about the character Mr. EAD. Hongo says he's a deformed version of Mario, which is why he's got a star on his belt. His name comes from Nintendo EAD. That's the department led by Miyamoto, who made F-Zero X. His racing stats are also EAD. E for body, A for boost, and D for grip. It's clever, but Hongo admits it was maybe a bit too clever, because those stats actually make Mr. EAD kind of suck to play with. Western fans often lament that Japan gets all the good stuff while we get the scraps, but Hongo points out that wasn't really the case, at least not for the N64. The conversation starts when a fan asks the difference between N64 games released in America versus Japan. Hongo says in general the difficulties ramped up for Americans. For example, in Japanese GoldenEye, there's more body armor and stronger auto-aim compared to the US version. The practice dates back to the early 80s, when America asked Nintendo to make Donkey Kong arcade cabinets less of a cakewalk. He goes on to explain that because most games launch overseas later, they often get fine-tuning, bug fixes, and a little extra content the devs couldn't squeeze into the Japanese version because of deadlines. Like in Majora's Mask, where they let us save at owl statues, Japanese fans couldn't do that, and were forced to reset time in order to save progress. So even if we got games late, Oftentimes, it resulted in a better product. As another example, Hongo points out that in Super Smash Bros., about 50 attacks were fine-tuned for the American version, and we also got post-credit congratulations screens they didn't have time to add in the original Japanese release. In fact, you could say Japan was the real loser when it came to the N64. Of the system's 388 games, only 195 came out in its home country. Meanwhile, Europe got 241, and America got 296. Japan never got a lot of games like you had as a kid, like Pokemon Puzzle League, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Dr. Mario, Rayman 2, any of the Gex games, Mortal Kombat's, Tony Hawk's, and almost 200 more. Most of that came down to the fact the console sold like crap in Japan. About two-thirds of all N64s were bought in America, so that's who got most of the games. For some games, though, it was due to licensing and legal problems, like Pokemon Puzzle League, which according to Hongo, never came out in Japan because they didn't have the rights to the cartoon backgrounds. Some folks don't realize just how bad the N64 generation was for Nintendo. Maybe because they were kids then and they had a 64, so they thought everybody had one. 
but right out of the gate, N64 sold far below Nintendo's expectations, only moving one-third what Super Nintendo had in its early years. One reader asked if new N64 games would keep getting made after the GameCube came out. Hongo said, yeah, of course, because that's how it had worked in previous generations, and that did turn out to be true, but just barely. The N64 only got five more games into the next generation, with the last one being a port of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 that only came out in Europe. Compare that to the Famicom, which got over 500 games after the Super Famicom's launch, all the way into 1995. Likewise, the Super Famicom survived well into the N64 era, with over a hundred more releases after June 96. Generally speaking, healthy consoles have longer tails. The N64's performance seems poor compared to its forebearers, but it looks even worse next to its console war competition. Over their lifetimes, Sega Saturn got about 1,000 games, PlayStation 8,000, but Nintendo didn't even hit 400. N64 sales were so bad, especially in Japan, that in 1998 Hongo called it a crisis and announced an ambitious scheme. The N64 doubling plan. So what did they do to double sales and win the console war? And did it even work? We'll get into that tale in our next video, along with the rest of Hongo's N64 question box, this time focusing on the console itself as well as Nintendo as a company. Like how they made Japan-exclusive Ocarina of Time and Banjo-Kazooie poker cards, and that Nintendo actually got their start making poker cards during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904. Russians like playing Duroc, which uses traditional poker cards, and a bunch of Russian POWs were locked up near Nintendo's headquarters. So the Big N made some cards for them. Hongo also shares some behind the scenes for rare and unreleased hardware like the Hyundai Comboy 64 and the Wide Boy 64 that let you play GBA games on your TV. Nintendo was considering releasing it to the public, but never did. Again, thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to play it for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox now by using our link in the description or pinned comment. New players and those who haven't played in the last six months will get a massive bonus pack across all platforms including premium vehicles and more. This is available for a limited time only, so act fast and claim your rewards now. If you're looking to watch something right now though, did you also know the 64 disk drive had over 60 cancelled games like Mother 3, Ura Zelda, and Super Mario 64 2? For a two-hour breakdown of every cancelled 64DD game, click the video on screen. Special thanks to our translator Jacob, Eurasia M for footage capture, and thank you for watching. See you next time!